So today I'll be presenting on identifying polyploid cells in tissue images via instance-aware semantic segmentation. So to get started, a polyploid cell is a cell with more than one set of chromosomes, meaning that it has some extra DNA. A cell may become polyploid when it escapes part of the cell cycle and avoids division. Uh, researchers have recently found that cancerous polyploid cells can be formed during chemotherapy. So it's necessary for drug developers to develop some drugs to administer along with chemotherapy to prevent the production of polyploid cells. And where I step in is automating the identification of polyploid cells. So here's an image of mouse liver tissue. And you'll see that the blue cell includes uh, two nuclei. And this is considered cellular polyploidy, whereas the other two contain only one nucleus in the cell. But that nucleus has more chromosomes than a normal cell. Polyploidy is also categorized based on the number of sets of chromosomes. So 4N would be four chromosomes or two sets of chromosomes. Here's a video uh, using a uh, GUI we created in PyQt, where the user will load in some images. Um, you can see we have created a number of different processing modules, but here they used contours because we'd like to uh, outline the outside of every cell when labeling for the training data. And so I show here three different types of cells, the ones seen on the previous page. And so once the user is done labeling all of the training data, it'll look something like this. And we used 30 images similar to this to train our algorithm. And for that, we used a custom neural network with the goal of instance-aware semantic segmentation. We chose this because it accounts for spatial patterns among neighboring pixels in, a, in an image. And this is particularly useful for detecting an edge of, say, a cell or a nucleus. It also accomplishes two tasks of segmenting out a cell from the surrounding tissue and other cells in the image. And then it's also able to classify that polyploid cell into the type of polyploid. So for this project, we did 8N nuclear, meaning there are four sets of chromosomes in one um, nucleus, 4N nuclear, two sets of chromosomes in one uh, nucleus, and then cellular ploidy usually only contained, we only saw cells that contained two nuclei within a cell. So our custom neural network is a fully convolutional object detection neural network with a region segmentation second stage. I have a diagram here showing more details into that. So we used a backbone based on HRNet and a detection head based on RetinaNet. This produces multi-skill maps of activations, which are a set of bounding boxes or potential bounding boxes for each detected object. And then we use non-maximum suppression to eliminate any duplicate or overlapping bounding boxes. So you, the result is one bounding box per identified polyploid cell. The region of interest pool um, goes back and gets features from a previous layer in the neural network, which is then fed into a second stage convolutional neural network, which predicts which pix pixels are part of the detected object or polyploid cell. So the training data consisted of 30 images similar to the image that I previously showed. Each image contained approximately 40 cells per image. We trained for 300 epochs. The non-maximum suppression threshold was 0.4, and the object detection threshold was 0.5. And here's another video of the user um, using the convolutional neural network that I just described. And so now they choose the processing module that includes AI, 
um, grabs the set of images um, that came from the same data set, but we split it between training and validation. And then here's how the algorithm auto annotated the image. You can see it did a pretty good job. It did miss a few. Um, the easiest ones to see are like here, there would be another cellular polyploid cell. So after validating on 25 similar images, we decided to try some bootstrapping, which means that we corrected the labels within that PyQT GUI that we created, and then combined those corrected results with the previous set of training data, um, and then retrained the algorithm and validated a second time. So for the results, I wanted to compare before and after bootstrap to make sure that it was actually a productive thing to do. We had both um, parameters for the model saved before and after, so you know you can um, go use the previous one if the bootstrapping wasn't actually effective. And it's also split into general polyploidy and polyploid classes. By that, I mean that we're going to see how accurate the algorithm was at detecting a polyploid cell in general, because that's really what's important. Um, and then the polyploid classes is how well did it do at identifying um, each cell as the 4N, 8N, or cellular polyploidy. So you can see that bootstrapping actually did not improve the precision. Um, in both cases, it decreased by about one or two percent, but it did greatly improve the recall by five or six percent. The F1 score is something we use to combine precision and recall, which are um, methods of evaluating a neural network. Um, and we do that because precision and recall tend to be inversely related, and you can see in both scenarios, the F1 score improved after bootstrapping. And then another note is just that in medical applications, we tend to care more, or we, we don't mind um, false positives, but a false negative would have more weight. And um, that is, so it's good that recall improved in this case. So here's an image of some mouse cancer tissue. So the images that we trained on that I've shown throughout this presentation are healthy mouse liver tissue. Um, polyploid cells do exist in livers, um, and it's completely healthy. However, the whole purpose of developing this algorithm is to perform it on cancer tissue um, during drug development. So here's one image that I've received from my collaborators um, in the medical field. And as you can see, it's a lot more crowded and complicated. So um, we're gonna be working on finding some sort of artificial intelligence to identify polyploid cells in something like this or in their lab setting uh, as they're developing drugs. And so I have a number of different collaborators who this project wouldn't be possible without. We have Dr. Mahadevan from the Mays Cancer Center and UT Health San Antonio. Um, and then he runs the cancer lab. Dr. Dre is a cellular biologist at UT Health. Patrick Conway is one of Dr. Mahadevan's um, students. And then David and Hakima work with me at Southwest Research Institute. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you. Thank you for the talk. It was very interesting. I want I noticed that you work with H and E images, right? So, do you worry about how different preparations at different sites will affect the validity of your? training when you try to use uh, test data? Yeah, so if we're, if we're training the algorithm on certain H&E stains and then validating on a different set of images, 
Um, we haven't tried that yet. I'm assuming that could be um, a challenge, but in which case we would probably diversify the training set of data. Um, this, since it was in healthy liver cells, was more of like a proof of concept. Can we even do this? Um, and in the end, with this partnership with the, the doctors at UT Health, the goal is really to um, develop an algorithm specifically for them to use in their drug development. And so if we can assume that they're always going to be using the same types of stains, then that wouldn't be much of an issue if we in the future decide to um, deploy this to a wider audience, then that'd definitely be something to worry about. Um, thank you for the nice talk. I wanted to ask, uh, how long did it take you to create your curated, annotated, labeled images? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and also, have you ever tried any unsupervised training to boost and increase your l pool of labeled data? Yeah, so it does take a long time to go through and label. Um, I didn't time it. It is helpful on you know a larger screen with a nice mouse. Um, and what your other question was? Unsupervised ways of... Right, right. Okay, um, so yeah, that's something we're implementing because the, the tool that I showed we're kind of using in a number of different AI uh, medical imaging projects. Um, we don't have anything like set for that, but the bootstrapping was a bit of a way that I kind of tried halfway through the project. Um, just the results were like, okay, so um, it became a lot faster that second round of training um, because you had the results and you know I just had to correct two or three on each slide. So the second round of training was a lot faster. Okay, thank you. Thank you.